trusted the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. And we will shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet, yeah, we will shout out your praise, there's joy in the house of the Lord, and our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet, cause we will shout out your praise, shout out your praise, shout out your praise. All right. Good morning. How are you? Good. This is an exciting day. Uh, you might have noticed something a little bit different here, and there's a handful of people that are wearing this shirt. We're celebrating baptisms today, and that's a pretty cool thing. So we're going to encourage you a little later in the service to cheer loudly, uh, to take photos, videos, all that stuff. Uh, because this is uh, a great momentous day. Welcome to our online crew as well. Before we continue, would you turn around, you say hi to somebody, uh, learn a name, we'll get back to worship here in just a minute. when I 
So great a mercy What heart could fathom Such boundless grace The God of ages Stepped down from glory To wear my sin And bear my shame The cross is spoken The cross is spoken I am forgiven the King of Kings calls me His own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Sing hallelujah, praise the one who sent me free. has lost his grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope think in the morning that sealed the promise your very body and begin Silence the roaring lion Declare the grave has no claim on me Oh Jesus, yours is the victory Oh, sing hallelujah Praise the one who sent me free His grip on me Cause you have broken every chain There's salvation in your name Jesus Christ, my living hope Oh, Jesus Christ, my living hope Oh, God, you are my living You can take a seat. Uh, that, those are powerful words. That is why we're here. That is, that's baptism right there. This is the visual representation, the outward expression of the change that's happened inside us. And so I'm going to invite the uh, people who are getting baptized to come up on stage and join me. We get to hear from them. So this is, this is pretty cool. Right now, we get to hear a little bit from each of these. You might notice the age here. It's kind of cool. Just saying. Um, and then later, after Dave preaches, then we'll do the actual dunking here. So uh, have you prepared something, young sir? Okay, I'm going to ask you some questions. Here it is. Uh, first, would you tell us your name and how old you are? Um, I'm Logan Trimble, and I am 12. Right on. <laughs> We're going to have multiple questions, so I'd hold the applause just to... Thank you. <laughs> um, Logan, would you tell us uh, when you came to know Jesus as your Savior? Um, I'd, maybe like around eight. Okay, that's awesome. And uh, today, why are you choosing to be baptized? 
because after reconciling and thinking about God and everything, I finally decided to put myself on the stage and get dunked. I love it. That's awesome. All right, now we can clap for him. That's good. All right. These two are related. It's brother-sister combo here. Would you introduce yourself, young lady, and how old you are? I'm Lorelai Tramble, and I'm 11. And would you tell us when you're getting there, you're close, we hold the applause till she's done with all her questions. You'll get there. I know. You'll get there. Uh, would you tell us when you came to know Jesus as your Savior? I think I was six. That's awesome. Very cool. And why are you, same question, why are you here getting baptized today? Because I love God and I want everyone to know it. Boom. <laughs> now. Okay. All right. Young lady, you know the drill. Hi, I'm Cora Ryan and I'm 10 years old. Very cool. And when did you come to know Jesus as your Savior? Um, I think around like I think like seven or six or eight, I don't know. <laughs> All right, very cool. Um, and then tell us again why you want to be baptized today. I want to be baptized because I feel like I've like kind of just like want to like fully let myself like become part of the church and actually like I love to be around like people like me. So it's like really nice. That's awesome. <laughs> Okay, same drill, you know, let us know who you are. Uh, I'm Matthew, I'm 17. Very cool, and when did you come to know Jesus as your savior? Uh, I came to know Jesus when I was like six, I think. And why are you here being baptized today? Uh, I'm here to get baptized because uh, I, I had a lot that happened in my life and it was a really big struggle, and this is just my way of saying I got through that, and I'm back, and I'm doing great. Awesome. Let everybody know. Cool. Okay. Uh, I'm going to pray for these uh, young people up here, and I want to do something a little different here. We're going to pray for him, and I want you to kind of join me in prayer. So I'm going to ask you maybe to get a little uncomfortable. Would you extend your hand out? Would you join in prayer and reach out towards them to know that we are with them together in this? God, we love you. We thank you for Logan, Lorelai, Cora, and Matt. God, we thank you that you have done uh, a work in their hearts, that you have changed them, that you have called them to follow you, and they have responded to that. And it's not just something that's done in them. Now they are taking this and saying, hey, this is who I am. This is my identity. And God, we stand with them and we support them. We are the community that surrounds them and uh, will continue to uh, be with them as they grow in their faith. So God, we lift them to you. We thank you for this decision that they've made today. We love you in your name. Amen. Amen. Would you give them a hand as they head on down? Oh, I get goosebumps, that kind of stuff. It's just exciting that young people choose to follow Jesus. It's kind of awesome. Okay, we're going to switch a little bit here. I got a couple quick announcements. My name is Austin, one of the pastors here. Uh, a couple quick announcements before we continue on in worship. Uh, a couple things that are coming up. We have a holy yoga and Enneagram mini retreat. We've got this cool Christian uh, retreat that's happening. Uh, it's a Christian yoga class and uh, taught by two Christian leaders. Uh, it's $100 per person, 75 bucks if you sign up with a friend, uh, sign a friend up. It's Saturday, November 4th, uh, 9 a.m. over at our Pasadena campus. So a cool opportunity to uh, flesh out uh, and work through, do some cool yoga stuff uh, while you're talking about faith. Uh, last thing is uh, parents got a little heads up that last Sunday, uh, that's next Sunday, we're doing a little Candy Palooza thing down at Kids Church. 
kids are encouraged to come in costumes. They might get home, sent home with a little bit of sugar as a precursor to what is coming uh, for Halloween. So just be a heads up, that's coming up, and it's going to be uh, a lot of fun down at Kids Church. Uh, I'm going to invite our ushers to come forward to receive our tithes and offerings, and then we will continue in worship. God, we love you. We thank you for the gifts that will be given today, throughout the week. Uh, we'll continue to use them for the building of your kingdom. We love you. Amen. So uh, what we uh, can afford to do in this uh, situation is lose seats. That's uh, not one of the things that uh, we uh, do. So thanks for being crowded and you know, squeezing in and all the things you're doing to make it happen. Uh, by the way, this is the first time we've ever done baptisms when we only had this one room to work with. You know, we always have a place you can kind of do all the other things that need to be done. So... Uh, we do all of our baptisms at the close of the service, so if you're wondering what's happening now, uh, you have to listen to the sermon. <laughs> so, there you go. Welcome. Glad you're here. Uh, as you can see, things are progressing around us, and I just, as a way of just encouraging you to pray, uh, first of all, let's continue to pray for this day, for the celebration we have with baptisms. Uh, believe it or not, we're just a few weeks from kind of wrapping things up with this construction project, and uh, that could use some prayer. So as you can pray the blanket prayer over all of it, uh, you can pray about the fact that we're coming to year end, and year end is a season in which 
you know, we, we got big doings with uh, raising money and doing this stuff for the project, but we've also got a church to run. And oh, by the way, we have Faith Promise and we have ministries all over the world that we support. So let's be faithful as we get here to year end and think about how that all fits together. There's lots of things to pray about. Everybody doing okay? Yes. All right. I'm glad you're here. Paul in chapter 8 of the book of Romans said, hope that is seen is no hope at all. And that's disappointing because that's my best kind of hope. <laughs> Anybody else like that? Like my best hope is what I can understand and see. It's that other kind of hope. And when I don't see it and it takes faith or something, that's a harder kind of hope for me to have. It's harder for me to produce. It's harder for me to live in. It's harder for me to feel it. And so we're thinking a little bit today about the messiness of hope. And one of the things that I think is so important is that hope is born in need. We don't really get a lot of hope when we don't need it, but then when we need it, we wish we had more than hope, but we'd like to have hope, but the need causes us to not feel very hopeful. Everybody with me? All right. Amen. Good. Thank you. Back in uh, 1738, there was a sort of disenchanted Anglican priest roaming the streets of London. He had already had sort of a storied life. He, he grew up in a Christian home. His father was an Anglican priest, and so he was a devoted follower most all of his life, and he followed in the pathway of uh, his brothers and sisters. He was highly educated in fact, he excelled in the academics and found himself at Oxford University where he uh, once again did incredibly well and became a fellow at Christ College at Oxford University and had a very successful academic teaching career, but didn't feel like it was really him, didn't feel like it fit with who he was. And so he decided to leave the academic world and get into the local pastorate. And so he became a, a priest in a local Anglican church. And, and he seemed to fit better with that. He felt more like he was in his calling. But he was frustrated by the, the nature of the church's unwillingness to evolve and change. He felt like it had become somewhat indifferent to the needs of the world. And, and so he, he, he just felt this kind of turmoil. He wanted to change the world. He wanted to do something significant. And so he, he set aside the priesthood for a while to become a missionary. And he left England and he came to the United States, to the colonies, specifically to Savannah, Georgia. And, and his vision and hope, he would write later, was he was going to come and convert the Native Americans. He was, he was going to come and do this great missionary work and see these folks come to faith. And, and that was his hope and that was his belief and that's what he was all about. Sadly, that year in Savannah, Georgia, it didn't go well and... By the end of the year, he actually had a warrant out for his arrest, and he left rather hurriedly and jumped on a boat and headed back to England. On the way, he was caught in a massive storm, and on board the ship with him were a group of Moravian missionaries, and the Moravians were a little more mystical in their belief system, and they had a little more emotional experience with God. And, and so as the storm raged and everyone were in fear for their life, the Moravians kind of sat around going, hey... We live, we die, whatever. And he was very moved by that act of faith, by that kind of settled sense that God was in control. And so in 1738, arriving back in London, he walked up from the Thames, up past the Tower of London, and he found himself wandering down Aldersgate Street. And he passed a little Moravian mission, and inside they were conducting a service, and they were... Uh, singing and praising, and he was drawn to the music, he said, and so he walked in and he sat down on the back row, and as the music concluded, the pastor stepped up and he began to read from Luther's preface to the book of Romans, and he began to talk about this book of Romans. The man's name was John Wesley, and as he sat in that seat, he, he said he felt his heart strangely warmed. For the first time in his whole life, his whole spiritual journey, all of these years being raised in the church, serving uh, in the world of academics, serving as a pastor, attempting to be a missionary, in all of that time, it wasn't until this moment he said that he, that he felt that he was really in a place with God that made sense. 
he would convey the story to his brother Charles. And Charles, in trying to capture the moment, would sit down and write a hymn. Hark the herald angels sing glory to the newborn king. You thought it was a Christmas song. (laughs) No, it's a song about what it means when God fills us unexpectedly with hope and focus and love and care. That's the sound effects just to keep you... So to just think for a minute, I don't know about you, but sometimes I pray for that. I think sometimes when I look at the need in the world and need in my life and the complexity of what happens, I I, I think what I need is I need God to strangely warm my heart. I need him to zap me and fix me. And I wish he would. I know others do too. Amen. Amen. The Jewish people for centuries divided themselves neatly around the narrative of God's work and their story. The deal was that most of them believed that they were God's chosen people, that that God had a greater purpose in their life. In fact, the promise of the original covenant was that I'm going to make you into this great, great nation. But by the first century, it was really hard to have faith in the system. Because the fact is, out of the last 10 centuries, just one century, they had lived an independent life. Other than that, they had been conquered and ruled by every other world power. Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, now Rome. And and because that narrative, wrapping the story around God's chosen people and a great nation and now this oppression, you know, a thousand years of oppression minus a hundred doesn't add up to a happy life. And so they divided neatly into a couple of groups of people. One group of people decided that what ought to be done is there ought to be some kind of militant way of taking back what belongs to us. And so they began to formulate how they might conquer the world. And there were several kinds of speculation going on within the context of these folks. One was, we're going to raise a big army. We'll get a charismatic leader. We'll raise a huge army. We'll have the most powerful army in the world. And then we'll we're going to conquer everybody. We're just going to conquer everybody. That's a, that was the plan. Others in the group said, that's kind of impractical. The fact is, it would take too much money and it would take too long to build that kind of world-dominating force. What we need is we need a savior from heaven. We, we need a warrior, a celestial warrior to peel back the skies and everybody will just fall to their knees in fear and, and Israel will take its rightful place in the world and, and will rule everybody. These are the two mindsets that are happening inside the context of the first century. It is into this context that Jesus is born. There's another group of people. They've been accounted for all through the time. In fact, we first start to hear about them way back in the fall of the northern kingdom, way back when Assyria dominates the northern kingdom. We start to hear about these people, and they come to be known as the quiet of the land. The quiet of the land are a group of people that trust God is in control, and and they just rest in that reality. And and they don't really think about military things or or the skies being pilled back. They they don't think in all of those terms. They think in quiet trust of God that he's in control and he's working his plan. And we meet a couple of them soon after the birth of Jesus. They're named Simeon and Anna. And they're over at the temple when the child Jesus, eight days old, comes to be presented and to have his circumcision. And, And in this moment, we see Simeon. And I wonder what triggered Simeon's been over at the temple for months and months and years and years and years, as has Anna, waiting for the sign from God. And both of them have received the promise that they will see the Messiah before they die. And something, because there's a lot of kids coming to the temple for this ritual, but something about this baby stands out to them. And Simeon takes the Christ child and holds that baby eight days old in his hands and said, this is the Lord's chosen. Thank you that you have allowed me to see this before I die, that you have allowed me this moment. And then he says, but this child will cause the division of many. And many will fall away on account of this child. And this child will reveal the hearts of human beings. It's that sense that in the midst of need, in the midst of a desire for hope, 
there's a whole bunch of people that have decided how it's got to be, and they've become very outspoken and opinionated and strong-willed, and they shout a lot, and they rage a lot, and they're very angry. And here's the irony. In the midst of the greatest need, and hope is born in need, in the midst of the greatest need, they missed the presence of the living God tabernacled in human flesh. And as he talked about love, they formatted hate. As he did miracles, they called it deceit and trickery. As he expressed love and compassion and care, they called it hypocrisy. And it causes me to stop and go, have I put myself in a position in my journey, in my life, in my opinions, in the way I see the world, in my fears, whatever it is, so that in this hour of need, in this time of need, in my journey, in your journey, in our country, in the world, that we can't hear or see the actual hope that's with us because we've so strongly closed our minds to what God might be doing. That's what Paul is facing as he writes in the 8th chapter of the book of Romans. He's talked now in the trajectory of this letter, this group that has become deeply divided, they're one big mess. They're, they are unified around the reality of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The, the Gentiles are a mess. The Jews are a mess, maybe a bigger mess because they had more information to work with. But God has met that mess with his grace, his forgiveness, his redemption. That he's invited us into a maturing, growing process. Getting better. Growing and learning and, and, and being better in the context of the body of Christ. And he's acknowledged the struggle. I don't understand what I do. What I want to do, I don't do. What I don't do, what I don't want to do, I end up doing. Oh, wretched man that I am who will rescue me. And in this first section of the letter, chapter 8 then, becomes this powerful, climactic. Sort of, in fact, if you ever wanted to memorize a chapter in Scripture, maybe chapter 8 of the book of Romans is... In fact, you probably know a lot of verses from the chapter. You just didn't know they were all in one place. In one magnificent piece of writing. And so we gather to think today about what hope is really about and what it means and how it fits together. Everybody doing okay? All right. Is it hot in here? I can't fix it, but I just wanted to get your mind on it. And... By the way, it's nice to be in a crowded church, isn't it? I mean, yeah. Yes. I mean, I know people are like, oh, I was so inconvenient, but you know, you don't want to eat at a restaurant that's not crowded. I mean, that'd be weird. Hey, nobody wants to come here, but we can get in quick. Chapter 8, verse 16. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those that love him who have been called according to his purposes. The messiness of hope. So if you and I are, are, are going to experience real hope, we're going to have to engage a few things, Paul says. And here's the first one. There is the messiness of being children. The messiness of being children. 
He says, listen, you have been not only forgiven, but you've been adopted as a child. And that has certain implications. And here's some of those implications. When you're adopted as a child, you get to be a part of the inheritance. And what do we get to inherit? Well, we get to inherit the promise. We get to inherit the hope of eternal life. We get to inherit a lot of that stuff. But Paul doesn't leave it there. He says, I just want you to have this expectation. When you get adopted by the family, you get the good stuff, but you get the bad stuff too. Amen? Now, I don't know about you, but when I sign up for Christianity, this is what I want. I want the good stuff. I want the peace and the hope and the power. I want God to transform things. I want to pray over things and go, la, la, la. Amen? That's what I want. And Paul just says, listen, a part of being children, a part of coming into this family is that you receive the benefits of the family. You get the hope and the forgiveness and the grace and the love and, and God's going to journey with you and you get an empowering of the Holy Spirit and, and all of that benefit comes and the promises of the future, you, you, you know, a, a deposit in our souls of the Spirit. You, you get all of that. But just know this, you also participate in the suffering. And sometimes as children... It comes down to this reality. There is a messiness about being a child. Do you remember? And the messiness is, at some point, you have to believe that the people in charge know what they're doing. And as children, we do most of the time. But the older we get and the more opinionated we get, the harder it is to trust that the people who are in charge know what they're doing. And aren't we like that with God? There's a messiness to childlikeness. And that is that we, at some point, are in a space in which we understand that there is a struggle to being a human being. Even when we have faith in God. We participate in the inheritance, but we also participate in the struggle. That's a part of it. And you can't have hope if you believe hope is the elimination of all struggle. Hope is born in the places of need. Number two, there's a messiness of glorification. We don't talk about glorification very much because I don't think we know what it is. It sounds like something where they sprinkle pixie dust on you and you glow in the dark. And that is not what it is. The phrase that he uses there simply means this, that God is fixing what's broken. Glorification is taking what's broken and fixing it, making it whole again, making it work again. Amen? Amen. There's a certain kind of adrenaline rush in making things that are broken work again. Anybody, does, anybody here do home repairs? <laughs> that's a, that's a win-loss proposition. I mean, when it works, it works, and you feel good about it. When it doesn't work, it creates relational issues. <laughs> Just telling the truth. But there is a certain kind of rush when something that's broken gets fixed. It's kind of adrenaline going, <laughs> I did that. Did that right there. <laughs> Might not stay fixed long, but it's working right now. <laughs> That's the glorification Paul's talking about. We participate in the glory of God in our world. God seeks justice. He seeks that love is love and, and mercy is mercy and wrong things are made right. And we participate in the glorification of the world. What was broken is being restored, and we're a part of that. And that's why we have hope. Because sometimes we look at our life and we go, well, I got broken stuff, so therefore I can't have hope. But you only need hope when it's broken. Hope that is seen is no hope at all. I need hope when things are messed up. I need them when they're falling apart. That's when hope does its best work. That's when it matters most. It shows up in places of need. Number three, the messiness of perspective. Now Paul goes all the way back to the beginning. And he says, at the point of creation, God created this perfect world and human beings wrestled control away from him. And ever since then, we've been groaning. We've been hurting. And some people will go, oh, so we're going to talk about, you know, inherited sin. And I wasn't even there. How did I get to be the recipient of that? Well, let's, let's pump the brakes a little. Let's just talk about your story and my story. Because it seems to me that what we do is the very same thing. That God says, here's the world. I want you to trust me. I want you to follow me. Here's the things you can do according to my word. I want you to do all of this. You know, and then we go, hey, I'm tired of waiting. I'm going to wrestle control from God. And I'm going to do it my way. 
Anybody experience that process? And then things don't go too well. And I, I'm constantly coming back, you know, I, I, I do feel like a child. It's like God lets me take control, and then I go, you know, I broke this. Because <laughs> you either get me a new one or can you fix it, <laughs> you know? And then I'll let God be in control because I broke it until the next time that I don't like how he is doing things. And then I'll wrestle. And that's not just what happens to us on an individual basis. That's what happens to us as a culture. I don't want God being in control and telling me what I have to do and what I can't do and what's good for me and what's not good for me. I want to decide for myself. I'm a whole human being. I get to make it up as I go. Well, you can wrestle control away from God. But if you've got very many miles on you, you've done that enough times now that you go, I usually end up having to come back and go, you know, God, I broke it. Can you fix it? Can you unscramble the eggs? Can you... Can you do something with this? And Paul just says, I just want you to maintain a perspective. When you think about the brokenness of the world and the pain and what we're going through, I, I want you to stop and recognize that that is not what God ever wanted. But the pain and the suffering comes from wrestling control and, and doing it ourselves. And it makes a mess. So don't blame the light for the darkness. Because <laughs> you and I have plenty of responsibility in the pain that happens. Not all the time and not everywhere and not all of it makes sense. He's just saying, let's go all the way back to the beginning. God didn't intend this. He didn't intend death. He didn't intend sickness. He didn't intend sadness. He didn't intend all of this. But we wrestled control away. And now the whole creation waits in expectation. The groaning as in the pains of childbirth, waiting finally for the glorification when everything gets fixed, when everything is done right. Number four, the messiness of patience. Then he says, and, and here's what you're going to need in the process. Be patient. Don't you hate that? I mean, I don't preach on patience because God will try my patience if I preach on patience. <laughs> patience. 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 Who hopes for what they already have, but if we do not yet have it, we wait for it. Patiently, we wait patiently. We're calm. We don't get crazy. We don't scream and yell and fight and, and act crazy. We wait patiently because we trust what God is doing, that He's in control. That somehow there is a bigger plan than I can understand or grasp or connect with. And I wait patiently. And I never doubt He's working. I never doubt that He's got my best interest in mind. Patience. Number five, the messiness of surrender. He says, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness and intercedes to the Father with groanings that cannot be uttered. I, when I hear this, it, this is what I hear. I'm praying, asking God to do some things, and Jesus is going, that's not what he means. He thinks that's what he wants, but that's not what he wants. Let me tell you what he really needs and what he really wants. And at some point, just this statement that Paul makes is a powerful thing. Because I don't know about you, but I have a very strong belief in my own opinion. <laughs> Amen? Amen? And I have to ask myself this question very frequently. Am I willing to think outside of my own opinion? Because it turns out that my reality is not the reality. All right, this is important stuff right here. When individuals decide that how they see it and how they understand it is the will of God, we got problems. Our attitude and spirit is that even with our best intentions when we pray, Paul says, the spirit intercedes with groanings that cannot be uttered because we don't know what we ought to pray for. We think we do because we're smart and we did the research. Can I get an amen? amen. You do? No, we have whole countries at war because of this reality of what it means that God is saying. And somewhere we humble ourselves and surrender. God, this is what I think, but I humble myself and I surrender because I want you to lead me and I want you to change what's going on up here and what's going on down here. And I don't want to be a person that rages in my culture. I want to be part of the quiet of the land. I want to create space where my heart can be strangely warmed. I can try and try and strive and try and I can cross the ocean and I can try to do noble things. But the truth of the matter is, till you show up, 
until you do work in here, and you can only do work in here as I finally give up, as I finally surrender and say, you know what, just whatever you need to do. That's what I want. That's why we pray the prayer. We pray it as a church. Your will done on earth as it is in heaven. Why? Because the pastor is the brains of the church. Oh, no, he's not. (laughs) Amen? Amen. There's just one head of the church, Jesus Christ. And the rest of us are following him. We're going to serve in our season. We're going to rest with our ancestors. But we're going to live surrendered. Amen? Amen. Got to surrender some things. Got to let it go. Finally, the messiness of trust. Because we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. Do you trust that? That's the most misquoted verse of the Bible, by the way. It does not say, all things work together for good for them that love God and are called according to his purposes. That is not what it says, even though it will be quoted that way very frequently. Do you know why that is not a great quote? Because all things are sometimes impossibly difficult, tragically hard. So it doesn't say all things work together for good. It says, in all things, God works for the good of those that love him and are called according to his purpose. It does say that. I was reflecting, uh, thinking about this sermon on when I committed my life to Christ. So I grew up in the church. I'm pretty sure that I, like, you know, was at church the first day I could qualify, you know, so like, whatever, two weeks old. You know, back in the day, we didn't care. Get a baby to church. We didn't know about infections and stuff. We weren't worried. But I was nine years old when I decided it was time to commit my life to Christ. And I don't know what crisis. It was a revival service. It was on a Friday night. It was Halloween. A nine-year-old on Halloween at a revival is a very bitter child. (laughs) Amen? So I'm at the back going, this is all stupid. Stupid church having to go to church. You're supposed to be trick-or-treating right now. They can't give me enough candy to make up for this. <laughs> and then they gave the altar call, and I knew it was me, <laughs> my bad attitude. And I've thought and reflected, what does a nine-year-old have to confess, you know? I didn't have a car. I couldn't drive. I had to be in bed by 8 o'clock. But somehow I knew at that moment I needed to confess a bunch of stuff and be forgiven. And so I made my way and prayed. And I've gotten better at sinning as I've gotten older. (laughs) Am I allowed to say that? And this has been my experience. That whatever mess I've made, when I've taken the time to surrender it to him and to confess... He's looked at my mess and he's gone, let's see what we got here. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take this mess and I'm going to create a new plan A for you. Here's the best, I, here's the best life you can live right here. I want to take it. I'm going to use the mess you made. And then we get on down the road and then we blow it up again. You guys seen that scene in Apollo 13 where the guys on the spaceship they're they're you know they're losing oxygen and they got to figure out a solution and they they take everything that's on board that capsule and they dump it on a table and they go you got to make something that makes oxygen for that spaceship I think that's how God looks at our lives (laughs) you did what (laughs) all right well if you put the tube sock over that and you take the plastic bag and you put some duct tape on there I think that'll work Here's a new plan A. I'm going to get you safe. I'm going to get you home. I'm going to take care of you. And we believe it every day. He doesn't ever say, okay, you really blew it. Now you got, you're on plan C now. You're way down the list. You're, you'll, you could have done this, but you blew it. Now you're doing this. He doesn't ever say that to us. In all things, I will work for the good of those that love me and are called. And you got to trust me because that's what hope is. Right now, in every situation, I am working for your good. All the situations are not good. Some are tragic and awful and horrible. But I want you to have hope 
And I want you to be the quiet of the land. I don't want you to rage. I, I, I don't want you to be those people that are looking for some kind of solution that is, that is against the word of God. I want you to sit in the space and trust that God is working. And I want you to live in hope. Hope, the real thing. I want you to feel your heart warmed. I want you to rest in it. I want you to surrender to it. Because in times of need, we need hope. But hope is a messy business. And you and I are invited to make that choice. We're celebrating baptisms today. And the symbol of this event is simply this. God washes us and forgives us when we ask. When we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. But we can't see that. So this sacrament of baptism is an outward sign of inward grace. And in a moment, these kids that you've already heard testify, they're going to come and with their chosen pastor and influencer, they're going to be baptized and we're going to celebrate because this is an expression of hope. And maybe you need to participate today vicariously to bury some things in the old life and be resurrected to new life. That's our celebration. Let me pray as we prepare. God, thank you for the way you love us, for the way you care, for the way you carry us. I pray that you would walk with us. I pray that you would allow us in these moments to celebrate together this act of baptism. That you would allow for each of these candidates just a, a, a moment in which they celebrate and enjoy and feel the warmth of your grace. I pray that in these moments each of us would celebrate the invitation you have extended to us. An invitation to be changed, to be made new, to let the old be gone and to be resurrected into new life. I pray your grace would benefit uh, those in this place today so that each heart is filled with hope, a hope that sustains them, a hope that warms their heart and life, a hope that allows them to be quiet in the land. And so we dedicate these moments to you. We ask you to lead us and guide us, and we dedicate these moments to you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And everybody said together, Amen. 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 Logan, Wayne, Kakalan, Trimble, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
Matthew Alexander Hampton. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, church, let's stand and pray. And you are dismissed after this prayer. Would you pray with me, church? Gracious God, thank you so much for this morning. Thanks for this celebration of, of new life, this new creation life, God. And I just pray a blessing over every single one of these individuals who just got baptized, these young people, God. Would you bless them in amazing ways? And God, help us be the church who journeys alongside them as the body of Christ, who encourages them, who builds them up, who, who is able to help them when they've fallen down. God, help us be that church for these young people. God, thank you for what you're doing in the hearts of your people. We love you so much, Jesus. Amen and amen. You're dismissed, church.